everybody this is 22 tiger dude here and this is going to be a video where I catch up on some of the movies that I've been seeing in theaters but I never had the time to really do an individual movie review for them and as much as I would love to do individual movie reviews for these films I just don't have the time and if you guys don't want to sit through this whole video and you want to skip to a certain time to see my review of a movie that you're curious to know my thoughts on you could just skip to these right here it's right here on the screen right now now with that being said the first movie I'm gonna start reviewing for this is the shack and the shack is about this man played by Sam Worthington uh, he and his family they go on a trip and his little daughter his youngest daughter gets abducted and that's where Lisa Sam Worthington's character basically he feels lost, he feels hopeless now. He's not as, exactly as close to his kids as he used to, especially like with his daughter. And then he receives an invitation from God. He gets his letter. He goes to the shack for the first time since his daughter got murdered there. And when he's there, that's when he meets with God and the other Holy Spirits. And that's when he basically has to find himself again. So the shack is a film that I personally that was fine from the trailer. I mean, the trailer wasn't anything bad, but it wasn't anything to really rush out to. I did have a screening for this film, and uh, coming out of this film, I was pretty torn. I really was having a hard time deciding. I needed time to really collect my thoughts on the check, and really after thinking about the film, I just think it's okay. I don't think it's a bad movie. I could see what the filmmakers were trying to do with this film personally, and I do respect what they were trying to do. And there's some things I do admire in this film. First off, I will say that Sam Worthington does give a really good performance. Sam Worthington is a really underrated actor. I really don't think he gets enough credit as an actor. And this movie just shows why he's honestly a really underrated actor. He's really good here. He's really convincing with the dramatic moments, and whenever I did feel some kind of emotion towards this film, it's because of Sam Worthington's delivery. Octavia Spencer is very good in this film too, and everyone else, they're, they're fine. I mean, they're just doing what they need to do for the film, but I wouldn't say no one is particularly bad here. Everyone else, except for Worthington and Spencer, I thought they were just fine and they did what they needed to do to serve the story. I did think the cinematography was beautiful and even uh, the direction at times was quite impressive. And I do appreciate this film because it does explore the themes of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a very big part of this film and I did really like how this film was exploring forgiveness and finding yourself and having to move forward in life when you're going through something tragic. My favorite scene in this film is actually when Sam Worthington interacts with Wisdom. It's a pretty major scene actually and that's all I'm going to say from there because I don't want to really spoil anything, but I actually thought that scene was very compelling. I really liked what they did there. Now, as much as I do admire the, some of the things here in the shack, I have to say the problems I did have with the film is that, well, one, it does feel quite rushed when we are seeing the events leading up to what happened in the shack. I did feel like it was starting to get rushed. I do think visually, it's very noticeable. Most of the visuals that come up in the shack really take me out of the movie immediately because I could not believe how poor they were. The movie does have things that are very dumb. While I do admire certain things in this film, there are also times where the film does get pretty dumb. Not to the point where I'm angry, but I couldn't help but go, what the hell, in certain moments. Like, first of all, the fact that Octavia Spencer is God. Like, she's literally God, and these two other people are like the Holy Spirits. I did think that was pretty dumb. And look, I get it. The film wanted to show how God comes in 
different shapes and forms but personally I thought that stuff was pretty dumb and I do think that the movie does tend to drag in some points this is a two hour and 12 minute long movie if I'm not mistaken and it does get very boring for me and then there's things that happen in the third act that was out of nowhere it felt very out of nowhere now granted it did create for a nice emotional payoff, and I did like where the film ended, I'll definitely say that. But what happens, before we get to this nice emotional moment, it came out of nowhere for me. And then there were just times where I honestly thought the dialogue was very clunky. But really when I look at The Shack, I think it's an okay film. There's times where I do feel connected with the film because I can relate to the message of like forgiveness, but then there's times where I am bored watching the film, and then there's times where I'm just watching this film going, what the hell? I'm gonna give The Shack two out of four stars. And now I'm gonna be reviewing Table 19. I really wanted to do an individual review for this one, but I just couldn't. I was actually looking forward to Table 19, I'm not gonna lie. I thought the trailer was cute. I was hoping to have a cute, harmless movie. And just that just has a, that puts a big smile on my face. And oh my God, it is the complete opposite. Instead, of this being what could have been a nice movie that puts a big smile on my face and makes me feel good actually had me boiling. It was, I'm gonna say maybe 25 minutes in when I realized how bad Table 19 is. So very quickly to describe the plot, Anna Kendrick, she gets dumped to buy this guy, the guy that's about to get married because he dumps her through via text message. She's going back and forth on where to attend this uh, wedding or not and she decides to attend anyways and you know there's Table 19 and the reason there's a Table 19 is because it's basically a table filled with people that no one cares about. And so these people at Table 19, they connect, and that's basically your plot for the movie. And oh my god, I, I, I was speechless because I could not believe how dumb this movie was. And it pushed the boundaries of being more dumb as it kept going on. Now, I will say that the cast does try. I think Anna Kendrick, to be fair, is still pretty good for what she's given. I think Toby Ra Tony Ravioli, he's pretty good for what he's given. June Squibb, I think she's pretty good for what she's given. Stephen Merchant, Craig Robinson, Lisa Kudrow's fine, to be honest, she's fine. And then the actor that plays the guy that Anna Kendrick loves, Oh my god, uh, yeah, his his performance is bad, however. He's, I think, the worst performance in Table 19. But most of the actors, I feel like, are good for what the script gives them. There are a few times where I did laugh, maybe like three times, and maybe one chuckle. A couple of them from Stephen Merchant, actually. And the cinematography was decent at best. And that's all I could say for positives because... <sighs> now, first of all, Anna Kendrick is one of the dumbest characters I've seen in a while because when we get introduced to her, she doesn't... Like, I mean, first of all, the boyfriend breaks up with her through text and she still decides to attend this wedding anyways and she gets like a little RSVP letter whether as like she should attend or not and then she says yes but then she says no and then she burns the thing and then there's this whole drama with her and this guy that she likes and then when you get into more of their drama oh my the drama is horrible. It's not even believable. There is a scene where Anna Kendrick is talking to the this guy, and this guy is crying. He is crying. He's expressing his feelings on why he dumped her and blah, 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 blah. You're supposed to feel for him. It's actually embarrassing. I felt embarrassed for this cast because they can do better. All Everyone here, they deserve a better movie than Table 19, the script is 
horribly written. It tries to develop these characters and it just doesn't work. Oh yeah, Tony Ravioli is there just to basically get it with the girl. Craig Robinson and Lisa Kudrow, their reason for attending this wedding, and it's like Lisa Kudrow's main reason, which I won't spoil, but it is completely idiotic. June Squibb is just there, um, you know, to be supportive. And then Stephen Merchant, he's a criminal, but he's like pretending to be this important person. Uh, how? How do you mess up a movie this much? And then the predictable finale, the final 20 minutes, and then the freaking ending. <sighs> and I surprisingly forgot to mention this when recording my review. That's how much this film actually pissed me off. I forgot to mention this, but the comedy here was really, really flat. This is supposed to be a funny movie, yet as I was sitting in the theater, not only was I so angry watching this movie, but it was so awkward. There is so much awkward comedic timing with this film that it just falls completely flat. Even the editing in this film, I could not believe how horrid it actually was. One moment you'll see these characters talking to each other like they're hanging up in the hotel room doing weed which I thought was stupid as hell and then maybe the next moment you'll see like a random person at the wedding doing karaoke and it just feels so so awkward with the way they would cut to other scenes. It's like they had no idea where to go with these scenes so they're kind of improvising with the editing. That's how it personally felt with me and then this should come as no surprise but the movie is boring as hell i seriously was just waiting for this movie to end because it was really really painful just sitting through a movie that has a short running time and yet it feels way longer than its running time which i believe is about 80 minutes this is hands down one of the worst movies of 2017. I could not believe how stupid, how unbelievable, how uncharming. Yeah, this movie lacks charm big time. Table 19 really pissed me off. I hated this movie with a burning passion and it's gonna get one out of four stars. What a disappointment, seriously. Now I'm gonna be reviewing Life. So Life is directed by Daniel Espinosa. It stars Jake Gyllenhaal, Rebecca Ferguson, Ryan Reynolds. And this film is about like a group of these scientists that study this life form up in a space station. This life form is starting to grow and basically chaos just ensues from there. And I was actually really interested in Life. I really was, actually really really interested i really like the trailers and the more trailers i would be watching the more interested i would honestly get i wouldn't say excited per se but i was very very interested i was very intrigued on where they could take the story and sure maybe the concept isn't anything new you know it gives it has the concept that you see in alien but if it has a good script and you care about the characters, that shouldn't be too much of a problem. And boy, oh boy, life really disappointed me. Really, really disappointed me. Now, I do appreciate where they try to go with this film, but for me, it was just a really predictable movie with characters, most of them at least. I really, had a hard time latching on to. I mean, they underused Ryan Reynolds here. He's not even the film that much, which was a bummer. And I actually did like his character, but uh, it's just a shame that he's not even in this film that much. And Jake Gyllenhaal, I will say that I did care for him, but it took me a while to actually care for him, maybe around 
the 30 minute mark and Rebecca Ferguson as the movie goes on that's when I did start to care about them like there's a conversation that she and Jake Gyllenhaal actually have towards the end and I actually found that to be the most compelling scene and it actually really drew me in and that's the thing life isn't a bad movie there wasn't anything particularly bad about life like when we see these scientists like trying to discover more about this life form and seeing what this life form can do. I did find some of that stuff to be interesting. There are some moments that did have me at the edge of my seat. Some moments did have my heart pounding and there's not a lot of that, but whenever it was there, I actually thought it was very well executed. And Daniel Espinosa, I will say, for what he had to try to do, he did do a very good job uh, bringing us into this world and visually, it's a very impressive movie. It's visually beautiful and the look of this life form as you see it expand, it was really interesting and the gore you do see in life, very, very believable. But unfortunately, I just didn't really care about most of the characters and then there were moments where I was seriously getting bored. So it was kind of, a little bit of a roller coaster for me. Some moments really did interest me, and then there were other moments that did bore me. And then I did even think that the characters, the reason I didn't really feel for them is because the there wasn't really a lot of character development to them. Only a couple of characters get uh, developed, but not really a whole lot of these characters, which I do think is a bummer to be honest. And then there are, there are even a few decisions, not like a whole lot, but there are even a few decisions they make that I thought were actually pretty dumb. It's also very predictable too on who's gonna die. When you see a character about to go in a certain situation, you just watch the movie and then something happens, you're like, yep, well, there goes that character. I knew that was gonna happen. Oh, look, there goes that character. I knew that was gonna happen. And it was definitely hard to get into this movie in the first act. The coolest thing about the first act is that it was this one take shot. Larry, there's no cuts. It's this entire one take shot similar to the beginning of Gravity, you could say. And I'll admit that was cool, but I wasn't quite glued into the movie. But there was nothing particularly bad with life until the ending. While I can understand the ending coming off as really scary to people out there, and I could see how people could view it that way. But for me, from how the ending was executed it was really really stupid and it was so unbelievably stupid and it was so lazy in my opinion i actually was so frustrated for the rest of the day like i could not believe that's where the movie was leading us up to. Like, sure, I wasn't getting into the journey all the way through, but, you know, I would at least appreciate it if the payoff was worth it. If you're going to make a movie where I'm sitting through these characters and for, what, an hour, 20 minutes, I'm seeing them go through this chaotic journey with this life form, and it, and it ended somewhere, then it's all like, I could have at least admired life for that, but no, they just have to go the cheap stupid route and it was predictable too i was seriously predicting they're gonna they're gonna go in this direction huh they're they're gonna go in this direction and they go in the direction it cuts to end credits and i i was baffled seriously that was the worst thing about this film i was actually gonna originally maybe go two and a half stars with this film at best two and a half stars but because of how much i personally hated that ending I'm gonna have to give life two out of four stars. A very disappointing movie for me. I expected so much from this film and it was underwhelming. Plus it didn't help that the ending sucked. And my next review is Unforgettable. So the plot of Unforgettable is that Rosario Dawson is now dating Katherine Heigl's uh, ex-husband and Katherine Heigl basically will do anything to make her life a living hell. This film I know is getting bad reviews and trust me, I completely understand why. And I really did not have much expectations for Unforgettable. And it's pretty much, yeah, what I expected. It's 
forgettable. It should have been called forgettable. Just take away on and just call it forgettable and you basically have an accurate movie title because oh my goodness this movie is forgettable. Now I don't necessarily hate this film and the reason I didn't hate this film is because I won't lie some of the dumb stuff like this is a dumb movie this is a very very dumb movie but I won't lie when I say that sometimes not all the time though but sometimes the dumb stuff that happens in this film they're so preposterous that I couldn't help but laugh like wow the things that Katherine Heigl was willing to do. Although there's a scene where Katherine Heigl is jerking off and I could I could have done without that scene. I didn't need that. Now, I won't lie, some things did roll my eyes with this film. There are some moments that happen when uh like Rosario Dawson she's telling her story what the the events that have been happening with Katherine Heigl at the police station the police officer is such an idiot despite the fact that she's freaking bruised okay she's freaking bruised and all that she's telling him the truth yet he doesn't believe him so obviously that officer and the rest of the police officers they're no help whatsoever when it comes to this whole Catherine Heigl situation I mean she is in danger but then there are moments I'm not gonna lie that did give me really good laughs, laughs. there's this one scene with Catherine Heigl and her little daughter she just does something to her hair um wow that was wow I mean this movie is so over the top and in some areas, I feel like this movie is self-aware, but then in some areas, I really feel like this movie is trying to take itself seriously. So, tonally, it's a very confusing movie. Rosario Dawson, I do think she does do a good job. Hands down, she gives the best performance. I don't think the cinematography is really that bad either. I do think that it's competent at best. I do think that the cinematography is at least pretty decent. And Katherine Heigl, she doesn't do too bad of a job here. I mean, there are times where she's really overreacting. Other times, I will say, she does have a, she does have good acting chops when she's playing this stalker. There are times where she has her stalker movements, and I'm like, okay, that's pretty good, but then there's moments where she's really overacting, and I'm more like, okay, you can really calm down now. Especially when we get to the the climax, oh my god. If that wasn't ludicrous enough, the cliffhanger ending. Yeah, they actually ended this movie in a way where they could, they could make a sequel. <laughs> Oh, what what was this movie? I mean, I really wasn't angry, to be honest, with this film. I'm not going to lie. I got some entertainment value, but I, uh, it's understandable why people are hating this film because it's not good. I'm not going to go my way and say it's a bad film just because I do think the cinematography is competent and I do think that... You know, there are some moments in the storyline that I thought were actually entertaining. Oh yeah, and Rosario Dawson's husband, he's a f idiot. Just even though he's married to her and you're supposed to trust your loved one, he doesn't believe jack shit from her and it's really dumb. And not to mention that Rosario Dawson has like this dark past. There's a moment where the guy that she is really horrified of, he actually comes to the house and yeah, this movie is really all over the place, but I wouldn't go my way and say that it's like one of the worst movies of the year. It's just a very mediocre film. It's a very forgettable film. And yeah, while I did get some entertainment value out of it, I'm gonna forget about this movie as a whole. Unforgettable will get two out of four stars.
Now I'm going to be reviewing The Zookeeper's Wife. So The Zookeeper's Wife does tell the true story of this couple that live in Poland and World War II is happening around this time. And so with the zoo getting destroyed and some of the animals unfortunately not even making that, this couple, they have to save as many of their animals as they can as well as try to hide as many people at their zoo. So The Zookeeper's Wife is a film I was very interested in. I really did want to see this film. I really liked the trailer. I really liked these inspirational true story movies and obviously I think the cast is great specifically with Jessica Chastain and Daniel Bruhl and Nikki Garo who I think is a very talented director. McFarlane USA I think is a very, very underrated film. I thought Nikki Godrell did a great job with McFarlane USA. And I was really interested to see what she could do with this story because this sounded like a very interesting story. And it's definitely that. I have to say that I found The Zookeeper's Wife to be a very interesting movie, to be honest. While I do think that the film does drag in some parts there are definitely some moments where I did feel the pacing of the film and I do think that they could pick up the pace a little more. The editing I think even gets choppy sometimes in this film. And yes, you know, with these kind of stories, you can normally predict where it's going to go. But honestly, that didn't really take away from my experience. I thought Zookeeper's Wife did a very good job of showing us what this couple had to do. And I mean, uh, what this couple did, I have to say, they did, uh, they did a really great thing. They had to hide as many Jews as they possibly can from these Germans. Like they had to make sure that they were safe and the performances from everyone I think are really great. Everyone honestly does do a really good job. Jessica Chastain of course does do such a beautiful job of acting this film. You could feel the heart, you could feel her passion with the story and the way that she had to portray this woman that really just wants to keep these Jews safe. I did find that to be very compelling. And Daniel Bruhl, who plays this German zoologist, wow, he does an incredible job here. He really is just so terrifying. Like he actually does get under your skin. It's no surprise, Daniel Bruhl has proven at this point that he's a great actor and the way that he talks to Jessica Chastain's character, you know, this woman, this real life woman, the way he talks to her. There's a scene between him and her son. Wow, you actually felt pretty scared in that moment. There actually were some scenes that got legitimately under my skin and those scenes were because of Daniel Bruhl. He was incredible here. And there, actually, there are actually uh, disturbing images in this movie too. The harsh reality of World War II, what these Germans are doing. They show some images of dead animal bodies. They definitely don't hold back with this harsh reality and yes you actually do hear animals die you don't see them get killed on screen whenever you see an animal about to get killed they actually do go off screen they don't show it on screen but you could basically still hear them die and of course it is very sad especially with me being someone that loves animals it was definitely hard at times to watch this film I think it was definitely smart on Nikki Godrell's part to really not hold back on it because it is a true story. You know, she really wants to show us how harsh it was at this time in Poland. And I did think that she did do a very good job of showing the harshness of war. It shows glimpses of the harshness of war because there are rarely any war sequences that are actually in this film. Of course when it's there it is very well filmed and you really did feel like you were there but I should say it's more about us seeing what the people in Poland are going through like how many are terrified by this really cruel event, how many are barely surviving out there and seeing what these Germans are doing to them. It 
really does make you feel sympathy for them. And then just seeing these animals not make it, like she really does go in a lot of detail. The cinematography too is very beautifully shot. There's a lot of shots in this film that actually blew me away because of how good looking it is. Like the lighting is definitely very professional. The Zookeeper's Wife overall I do think is a very solid based on a true story movie. Yes, there are times where I did feel the pacing drag and I do think that it is choppy as far as editing and where they kind of structure the storyline. But I did find myself still compelled by the storyline and I did think that the performances were really incredible from everyone and Nikki Godrell did such a great job directing The Zookeeper's Wife. So I'm gonna give The Zookeeper's Wife three out of four stars. And now the last movie I'm going to be reviewing is How to Be a Latin Lover. How to Be a Latin Lover stars Eugenio Derbys, Selma Hayek, Rob Lowe, Kristen Bell, McKenna Grace, and many more. How to Be a Latin Lover does tell the story of this young man that meets this older woman. He easily gets turned on by her. And then 25 years later, this woman cheats on him with this car salesman played by Michael Cera and so he gets dumped he has to move out of the house now and he's forced to stay at his sister's home played by Selma Hayek and so as he is staying at Selma Hayek's house he is helping his nephew be a lover basically how to be smooth how to be good with the ladies okay I was kind of curious but at the same time I wasn't really sure because the concept is pretty dumb, but at the same time, if it's done right, I can really like a really dumb comedy. I was really hoping that maybe this could be one of those dumb comedies that could consistently make me laugh and just give me a good time. And it's, it's fine. It's whatever. I don't think it's a bad movie, although... I can definitely see how someone could hate this film because they do push for that PG-13 rating. Um, it is a PG-13 movie and they definitely do push without spoiling anything. That's all I'm going to really say. Sometimes I was laughing with the movie, but surprisingly a lot of the times I wasn't really laughing. I actually thought it was quite dull and the humor was really falling flat for me. A lot of the comedic timing felt so out of place in my opinion. And that's a shame because even though I wasn't particularly a fan of this concept, I was hoping maybe somehow I could get a lot of laughs out of it. But as a whole, it's not a bad movie. I will say the best thing about this movie is actually the cast. I did really like Eugenio Derbys. I, I know he's very famous in Mexico. I really only got introduced to him when I saw Instructions Not Included, which I do think is a very good film, and he's really good in that film. So it's been ever since Instructions Not Included, which I do think is a really good film that I've been introduced to him. And I have to say, he does do a very good job here. He tries to add a lot of charisma to his character. You know, this very selfish character. But I do think that Eugenio Derbys, he does do a good job in this film. Salma Hayek, I thought, did a really good job as his sister. There are actually some laughs that she definitely provides. And I do think Rafael Alejandro, who plays Hugo, the son of Salma Hayek's character, Character. This kid was great. Seriously, this kid put a huge smile on my face. He might have been my favorite character. I really did love this kid. And definitely the funniest scenes were whenever Eugenio Derbys was teaching him to be cool. McKenna Grace from Gifted actually even shows up here as Hugo's little crush, aka the girl he wants to win over. Although she's not in this film that much, I do think that she did do a pretty good job for what she was given. She was very charming as she was in Gifted. Rob Lowe shows up here too as Eugenio Eugenio Derby's best friend and I thought he was good. He had a couple of laughs. The funniest part dealing with Rob Lowe being a police officer. I am not going to go any further from there but all I'm going to say is that's definitely Rob Lowe's funniest scene. And Kristen Bell 
who also isn't really in this film that much, but she steals the show. She is very charming. She is so likable. And whenever she does show up, she just brings so much energy. And for a part that really isn't that big, you could tell that she's having a lot of fun. There is a scene where Eugenio Derby's character, Maximo, visits Kristen Bell. And we learn a little something from Kristen Bell that I won't lie actually did have me laugh and her role got more interesting from there. And oh yeah, before I even forget, it was actually cool to see Michael Cera in live action form because lately he's been doing animated movies, but I won't lie, even though it was only like maybe for a few scenes, he has like three scenes in total in this film, but still, it was really cool to actually see Michael Cera in live action form again because I think the last time I saw him was I think think when he had that small role in This Is The End. That might have actually been the last time, but yeah, cool to see Michael Cera here. So it's really the cast that does absolutely bring it, and the direction I do think is okay, but the problem, like I said, with this film is that it does get boring. A lot of the humor does fall flat. Rob Cordry shows up here, and I really don't think he needed to show up here, to be honest. Raquel Welch, I also didn't think was that interesting, to be honest. She plays McKenna Grace's grandma, and that's basically why Maximo is using this opportunity to teach his nephew how to be this player, so that way he could get close to Raquel Welch's character. And there's even this dumb subplot with Rob Riggle and this other guy, because of a situation Maximo gets into and Maximo owes them money. Not gonna really go into too much details there. Yes, I won't lie, there were actually a couple of moments. Uh, one moment actually deals with the text message. You'll, you'll know what I'm talking about when, if you've seen this movie, but besides a couple of times where I did laugh with that subplot, for the most part, I thought it was very unnecessary. It just felt like absolute filler. And the more heartwarming moments, surprisingly, didn't exactly work for me because really for the majority of this movie, Maximo is actually a very selfish character. But when they try to add some heart into the film, it felt really forced in my opinion. But at the end of the day, I'm gonna say that How to Be a Land Lover is is not bad it's not good either I just think it's okay it's a mediocre forgettable movie and the more I honestly think about this movie the more I forget about it there are some good laughs and I do think that the cast for the most part were really good I had a lot of fun with the cast and I actually did like the sister brother storyline when Eugenio Derby was interacting with Selma Hayek and how she needs to let loose more I actually did like that story but unfortunately the script is pretty dull for most of it. The humor could have been written a lot better and it's just not something to really run home about. So I'm going to give How to Be a Land Lover two out of four stars. So everyone, that is my catch-up review video for all of these movies. Let me know in the comments down below what you think about The Shack, Table 19, Life, Unforgettable, The Zookeeper's Wife, and How to Be a Aladdin Lover. This is Twain to Tiger Dude here, and don't forget that I will always have Tiger Power!